the Micah Richards bling boo. Bling! <laughs> 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 I'll try. I must have a, an old pair somewhere. The, the bling boot. Did you have an entire range? The Micah Richards lettuce? The Micah Richards creosote? <laughs> <laughs> Hello and welcome to the Rest is Football um, question and answer episode and um, thanks once again for the questions that you've sent in. Um, we've got lots and lots of them, we'll try and get through as many as we possibly can uh, and there's some crackers in there as well. Um, let's get going. Matt Baker asks, has there ever been a time you wanted to quit or walk away from football? Oh, um no, not for me. I mean, there was been some really dark times with my three serious injuries that I was out for six or seven months with each one. Um, but there was never ever once I was uh, I was going to quit. Um, I felt, I don't know, I felt empty. As you know, without football, it's yeah. very, very difficult when all the lads are going out to train and you're either at home on a bed or you're in the bed in the medical room and you can't move. It's really, really difficult. Hard times, but never thought about quitting, no. No, I, I never thought. I mean, I I didn't have the injuries that you had, but um, but you have spells in the game where you can get a bit down about how things are going and that sort of stuff, lack of form or, or as you say, injuries. But actually quitting something that you, you love desperately? Nah, nah. In fact, it's a sad day when you have to quit, isn't it? What about you, Micah? Yeah, um... I think we've spoken about this before. Maybe quitting, no, but right to the edge, just when my knee was so bad and I had to draw maybe 100 mils of fluid yeah. out of my knee. So for those who don't know, new listeners, I had um, my lateral meniscus. I had a couple of operations on the outside of your knee, which is essentially the cartilage. So the little fat pad in between your knees, which basically gives you that little bit support and protection. I don't have any of that anymore. So in essence, it's bone and bone rubbing together. So you see the way I walk now. And if I in, I don't know, you'll probably see guys when I'm sat down, I have to keep moving my, my knee just to give it um, a little bit of support. Otherwise it stiffens up and I can, I can hardly walk. Um, and then I remember I put the, the doctor at Aston Villa at the time in a real compromising position. So he, we wasn't even drawing fluid at training. He would come to my apartment and draw 100 mils out just so I could train. And I've apologized to him many times before. What he was doing wasn't illegal. I just want to state that fact it was me, it was my body. And I, I put pressure on him basically to do that and it'd swell up three weeks later and I'd do the same. And yeah, I thought to myself, this is not good this, I need to quit. But I just wanted to yeah. justify to myself that I could do it. And in the end, my knee is, you know, horrible. I think sometimes fans don't realise what yeah. players will go through or are prepared to put themselves through to actually get out onto, onto the field of play. And I know, yeah. you know, when players get injured and, and perhaps they're a little bit injury prone, it's very easy to jump on them and go, oh, he's always injured. He doesn't mm. care enough. He doesn't, he, he doesn't want to play. But I think for, for the vast majority of footballers, the one thing they'll, they'll do everything they possibly can to get out on the field of play. Agreed. Well, 100%. Yeah. So many players do. And because it's a game we love, we'll do anything for the game. We, we, we're in a pr privileged position to play football. So we are going to do everything and we never lose the love of the football. We might lose the love that comes with it at times, you know, with dealing with like the social media or the press, but the football we always, we always love. I agree. Let's uh, on to a more light-hearted matter. David Sowles. Have you or any of your teammates ever forgotten their passports on the way to a match? And what were the consequences of being unable to travel? Or are these things handled by someone else? Um, I can't recall. I think, mo I think most clubs take charge of that kind of thing, don't they? Nowadays. 
hold your hand. There was once at Newcastle, I really can't remember who it was, but one of the players did forget their passport once when we yeah. uh, we got with the whole thing. We had to be delayed. They had to go back home to get it. I can't remember who it was. It was one of the young boys, but <laughs> yeah, it was. Um, you can imagine the rest of the players weren't best pleased because yeah. they had to hang around the airport for another hour waiting for them to go and collect their yeah. passport. That's the, one of one of the joys, I suppose, of um, in, in the modern era is this is private jets. I suppose. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you forgot your passport. Oh, you're going to miss <laughs> the plane. Oh no, we'll just wait for an hour. Go home. Go and get it, yeah. come back, and we'll jump on the plane and we'll fly whenever you want. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, brilliant. You ever... F- no. no. We, we had to give our passports the day before, and if you didn't give them the day before, then you had to go home and get it because, yeah, the, the, the managers was like, we, we're mm. not spending time waiting for someone. <laughs> so, yeah. When you got yeah. people like Balotelli in your squad, yeah. You keep it safe, though. <laughs> um, from Charles, it has become expected that players go on to working in the media, coaching or management after their careers. But do you have any stories of former players who have gone on to have interesting or successful careers outside of sport? Yes, I'll go on this one because I've probably got the most um, successful, I, yeah. I would say, and the most interesting. So there's a player called Reese Rabara. Reese, it's, it's pronounced Rabara, but it's spelt with a W, okay. so it's Wabara. Do you know what I mean? Or oh, he yeah. says Rabara anyway. Um, and he was he come through the academy at Manchester City. Really good player. Could play centre half. Could play full back as well. Strong, fast, good on the ball. Pretty much had everything. And there was an era in the in the modern dressing rooms where. You don't you don't want to come fancy to training whereas suits or all your nice gear and and a lot of people didn't want to come in tracksuits so like Nike or Adidas you know one of your sponsors you, um some of the players used to come in but what he did he brought in a range which was sort of smart casual but also cost effect, uh, cost effective to players who weren't earning the big bucks. So you could get maybe a nice jacket and some trousers for maybe like 60 or 70 quid. All the young boys in the academy started wearing it. So obviously he designed it. Um, He started with a couple of his friends and everyone started wearing it. Then the first team started wearing it. Then gradually it grew and grew and grew. And now he's got to the stage where he's opened up his own shop on Oxford Street, I believe, just a couple of weeks ago. And now the turnover is supposed to be like 30 million a year. Wow, brilliant. Excellent. What's the brand? It's absolutely incredible. He had to retire around 26, 27. And a lot of people, he he basically had a, a Rolls Royce and he used to, turned up to training in the Rolls Royce <laughs> and the manager of the club, especially when you go down the leagues, are like, basically, you can't be turned up in the Rolls Royce. But he, he, he's, he was saying, well, I'm earning it yeah. and my future is sorted. What's, what's the reason why I can't turn up in a Rolls Royce? But a lot of managers started then becoming judgmental, basically saying he's not concentrating <laughs> on football. So he took the decision at 26, I believe, to retire and go full time into uh, fashion, and he's absolutely smashing it. Wow. It's unbelievable what he's done. What's the name of the brand? And the brand name is called Manier de Voix. Manier de Voix. Oh, and that's oh. what I mean. He even sounds fancy. <laughs> well, good luck to him. <laughs> good story. Well, good for him. Remember the Arsenal player? Um, he's got some kind of biochemicals company. I think they sold out for like zillions or something which is all that, yeah. quite interesting um they were acquired by an, an an american company and um employs about 80 people they've done particularly well um i also know of a guy who started a podcast company Uh, While we're on the subject, have you not got any businesses outside of football? When you finish, do you just stick to media 
and property. Is that what you guys did? I've got a sharing um, company called Speedflex Fitness Concept Machine. As you know, oh. guys, that's why I'm looking so trim. Oh, that's why you're in such good shape, pal. Huh? That's what Get it, promote it, promote it on here. We've got the numbers out. Come on. Actually, you know what happened? I was with my um, good friend of mine who was the physio at Newcastle United, Paul Ferris, left many years ago and decided he wanted to be a lawyer. Um, went right into it, did six years and was about two or three months off completing um, his course and becoming a lawyer. And he was actually ready to go on to the bar. I got the Newcastle job and I liked him that much because I'd spent that much time with him with my injuries and what have you that I asked him to come into Newcastle with me as the head of the medical department. He had a huge decision to make. He was six weeks away from completing his six year course. And well, you were sacked left by it then, and, anyway. So. He, he left it. He left it and came in with me to Newcastle. <laughs> and then, of course, came in for two oh, months no. and then that was it. He couldn't, he couldn't go back. I was like, oh my God. <laughs> And then my friend was at, my friend was looking for um, someone to, uh, to to help him with the company Speedflex, and asked him to go over to America. So he's now chief executive of the company Speedflex. So I managed to get him back in anyway. Otherwise, I'd have felt so guilty. Wow. What, what about your businesses, yeah. Mike? You're a property magnet. I know that. Uh, I, I I buy and sell. I've got a couple of different uh, companies where I buy. Um, sort of lower end of the market, rent them out, or I would do developments. I've done a couple of developments within the Leeds area where I'd buy the land, uh, get the plan in, and then build them out and then go again, really. And I've got properties all over Manchester and Leeds as well, just for a steady income after, because when I get cancelled, ultimately from, <laughs> from media at some stage... <laughs> No chance. <laughs> well, one word. Let's just put it right. Put it into context for the people. We are one word well, away from getting cancelled. And for sure. everyone's like, oh, Alan's already swearing. I'm just like, because on, he's got to talk prim and proper for 90% of his life. He's now got a platform where he can say what he wants, whenever he wants, and not be judged by it, you know? So, yeah, it's just for... And I enjoy it. I, it's something that takes my sort of mind off things and, and keeps you busy. So, yeah, property is definitely... Um, my go-to. What's, what's the name of you? Your property, your oh, property no. empire. No, because you'll be, you'll be Googling company house. Lettuce, <laughs> let, <laughs> lettuce properties. You, you'll be, uh, when I invoice for the, the rest is football, you'll be cutting them to half uh, price, won't you? Because I have to. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's funny. I, I, I've never been involved in any kind of uh, businesses or I'm not particularly invested in property and stuff like that. But... Um, until until gold hanger really um and that was a production company um predominantly to start with um started on about 10 years ago and then then we branched out into podcasts which is um, well give a bit of background though i know it's not about us but it's it's interesting conversation why did you decide to go into podcasting or yeah. a production company i've always been kind of, obviously i've worked in television for a long time i've made a number of documentaries for the bbc um and which I basically did for for nothing really um and just as just as out of interest and then you you, you work on them for quite some time uh, they eventually get go out and you get a lot of satisfaction from the fact that people enjoy seeing them um but um Tony, um, who you obviously know, um, Tony Pasto is my, my partner in the production um, company. Um, he had started his own production company. We worked together at the BBC for many years. Um, and then he went to ITV, had a big job, um, like head of football or something. And, and then we bumped into each other and he said, um, I've started my own production company now. Um, and he said, it's going quite well. He said, but I know you're always interested in the documentary side of things and making sports stuff. And, um, and I wondered if, you know, if you wanted to join, we'll have a, you know, equal partnership. And, and I went, yeah, let's give it a go. And, um, and we had a nice little production company and it was doing quite well. And then about 2016 or so, about four or five years after we'd been, four years after we'd been going, we, um, 
uh, we did a podcast. I did a podcast with Danny Baker, and it, it proved to be um, pretty popular. And we thought there was something in this. And then since then, um, things have grown and grown. And as they say, yeah, the, the rest, rest is history. history. Hey, hey. <laughs> uh, um, and on that note, uh, we'll take a break. Welcome back to the Rest is Football with me, Gary Lineker, Micah Richards and uh, Alan Shearer. And um, we'll keep banging on with the questions. Uh, thanks once again for sending them in. Um, from Grant. Hi, Gary. Question for all you lads. When you retired and suddenly you had a lot more free time, what was the first hobby or activity you picked up for the first time or from before your careers at the top? Cheers. Uh, easy one for you and me, probably. And it was um, certainly golf for me. So I'd never really played during my career, just occasionally. But Really? No. I oh, I didn't know that. I thought you played. I played a little bit as a kid. Um, and then, I no, once in a blue moon. I remember taking it up briefly in Barcelona um, when I'd signed. And I played with Mark Hughes um, on, a, on a few question, on a few occasions. And we were both pretty hopeless. Um, and then <laughs> after I retired, I thought I needed something else. I contemplated going back to snooker because that was the thing that I played through my career. I used to go and play in Willie Thorne Snooker Centre after training at Leicester. Every day I'd go from like two o'clock in the afternoon until eight o'clock at night and then go home. Um, but after 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 football, it was it was golf. And same for you, wasn't it? Yeah, I love. I mean, I loved golf well when I was playing. Um, so, and I couldn't wait to play more when I uh, when I retired. So I did. Um, so yeah, it was it was golf for me. You know, sometimes even <clears throat> when we used to get a Wednesday off down in uh, down in Southampton, I used to I used to get up stupidly early and go out and play and walk thirty six holes, yeah. play in the morning, have a bit of lunch, and then go and play another mm. uh, eighteen in the afternoon, and then. It took me it took me a couple of weeks to realise why I was absolutely f- Saturday. I didn't have any energy. <laughs> I was thinking, why why have I got heavy legs on yeah. a Saturday afternoon? I realised <laughs> probably the thirty six holes I'm walking on a Wednesday. Yeah. So it took you a while to work that out, did it? Al? Oh yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I just thought, what's happening here? What do you do, Micah? As daft as it seems, I don't have any hobbies whatsoever. Mm. How bad is that? I literally. Go to work, come home, watch a game, watch match of the day, do a live game. My hobbies now is just watching football. I know it sounds boring, but I just I just love football so much now, watching all the games and stuff. I ain't got gym. Is gym a hobby? Yeah, I go gym yeah, pretty much every day. Yeah. But I wouldn't I wouldn't say it's an exciting hobby. No. Yeah. Takes you a while to get those guns, doesn't it? <laughs> it does. It does. I'm in decent shape at the moment. Now. Oh, Micah, you're looking, you're looking ripped and strong and powerful. <laughs> anyway, that's enough of my chat up line. Um, Harry Wadley asks: Apart from the Premier League, what do you think is the best league in the world? I love the Championship, but it doesn't get the notice as other top leagues in Europe do. Love the pod. Uh, makes my night shifts bearable. Well, thanks, Harry. Um, um, I would, I mean, I'm enjoying the championship with Leicester in it, but I, I think it'd be a bit, a bit unfair to say that's the next best uh, league in the world. I would say La Liga, personally now. I think yeah, it used to be Spain, Serie A um, when I played. That was the, that, I think that was the best league in the world when I played, actually, um, because it's it's not since um, you switched to the Premier League that it's enjoyed its its current status, which I think is is probably up there although the Spanish would argue that they've dominated European competition for um, most of the last two decades and certainly in terms of um, amounts uh, the number of trophies won so yeah what do you think yeah would, you'd have to go along with the Spanish wouldn't you um, and when you look at how successful they've been as you said in Europe I know English clubs have had a, had a lot over recent years as well but La Liga you'd have to say for me uh, I would agree. I would agree. La Liga is probably the most, uh, well, the best league after the Premier League. But the, we don't get the games anymore, do we? We don't get the games. So I'm watching a lot of Syria, and it's really obviously because I played there as well. I always keep an eye on uh, Fiorentina, uh, Napoli. What they did last year, winning the league, 
Um, and then see how the Milan clubs do as well, especially now they've got a couple of English boys out there, Loftus-Cheek and Tomori at AC Milan. I always keep an eye on Syria. Also, it's worth mentioning Bundesliga, obviously. I think that that's kind of so well run. It's, you know, the, the great fan base, um, you know, that kind of sharing, th- that thing they have where the fans are involved in, in, in the way that the clubs are run and stuff. I think it's I think it's a really good league with really positive, aggressive, attacking uh, football. Um, so, you know, each league, there's plenty of them. Um, but obviously the Premier League uh, takes some beating, really. Paul Wallace, how do boot deals work? Do you get to try lots of different brands? Uh, what if you sign a deal with someone, but their latest batch of boots aren't any good or you don't fit you right? Uh, not your preferred style, etc. <laughs> Mike is going to say whoever pays you most. <laughs> but it's true though, isn't it? I mean, it, all boots go through different timings. So you remember the, the R9s? They were unbelievable they was the best boots <laughs> and then adidas had the, the the predators as well which were scintillating the world cups all the defenders used to wear the copa mondiales you remember Ooh, them i remember those yep. remember I them those. i think it just depends what is the best boot at the time so i've been sponsored by adidas stand finders nike <laughs> stand finders <laughs> and nike <laughs> But it's weird because I was playing for England at under under 16s level and everyone else had a boot deal, but I didn't have a boot deal. I had free stuff. So they used to call it like a, a just product deal. So you don't get paid. So you get all the boots that you want and you get all the tracksuits and all that sort of stuff. And it was only until I played first team football at 17 at Man City, then did I get a boot deal and I think at the time they were offering something like 15 grand a year it's not massive massive it's it's mainly for the flair players who are going to sell the boots who get the the big money but for a 17 year old to get an extra 15 grand a year on the deal I was more than more than happy I uh, I had Umbro all my life I uh, yeah, I was a sixteen year old. Umbro till I die. I'm umbro till I die. <laughs> <laughs> I was a sixteen year old down in Southampton and I wrote off to three or four companies, uh Umbro, Adidas, Nike. And Umbro was the only response I got back. You actually thought, wrote a letter okay. to them? Yeah, I wrote a letter to three or four companies asking if they would um if I could have some free gear and free boots. And Umbro were the only ones that um that came back to me. And they, it was like, Mike, I just said there, they gifted me some boots and kit and there was no financials in it at all to begin with. And then obviously I scored, um, I scored my hat trick on my debut. And then I signed a contract for a little bit of money, not a lot. And then, you know, I was, I'd moved then to Blackburn and I think I was, so that would have been in 1992. So around about 94, 95, I got an offer from Adidas, which which they were prepared to pay me 600 grand more than Umbro Oof. over the length of the contract, over a four or five year deal. And just because Umbro were the first ones to come to me and I'd been with them for years, I turned them down, stayed with Umbro. You're a loyal man, aren't you, Alan? <laughs> <laughs> I stayed with Umbro, yeah. And I wore Umbro from start to finish, from 1988, until 2006. They fit in the walkers, don't they? The walkers, ready salted, umbro, <laughs> just basic, efficient. Loyalty, Mike. You know loyalty. What I mean? Been 30 odd <laughs> years. Um, I obviously wore Quasar boots. I, I, I don't know whether it's appropriate that at the moment that I'm wearing Quasar boots that the bin men have just arrived outside. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably a bit harsh, but they 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 weren't the best ones I ever did. I had a nice nice um, I don't know, Sondico deal. Remember the shin pads? Sondico it was massive shin pads. Um, that that, and I never really wore shin pads, but so um, but I did a deal. And I remember we did a, a photo shoot with um, Brian Robson and Ian Rush, the three of us, and it, we were like um, I can't remember. It's like, like dressed as gangsters and all that kind of stuff for the promotions and. Um, but I, I kind of moved around in terms of my footwear because I started with um, 
Adidas didn't get any money. Then they, then I had a deal with Adidas, and then um, then Quasar came in and um, as a new brand. And and then when I went to Japan, I wore um, you know Asics. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So I w wore those over there. That was that was quite a. Luke. You followed the cash, Micah. You followed you the follow, cash. Followed the followed the yen. I had a yen. <laughs> I had a yen to earn a few, Bob. I uh, had some some boots actually made for me. It was called the Micah Richards Bling Boot. <laughs> <laughs> Bling. Uh, I'm not exaggerating. No, no, I'm not exaggerating. It was like a bling a boot. silver shiny. I don't even know if it was a predator or it was that sort of thing. I'll try and get, I'll try. I must have a, an old pair bling. somewhere. Did, did, did the, you have an entire range? Boot. The Micah Richards lettuce, the Micah Richards creosote. <laughs> you could have a whole range. Do you want to see, here's a picture of me, Rushy and Br Brian Robson. Harry's found one. There you go. How's there? You see it? There you go. Look at that. Gangsters. Oh Ooh. my God. Look <laughs> at <laughs> that. <laughs> Proper players. The Micah Richards Bling Boot. <laughs> what a name, the Bling Boot. I love that. Look at that picture. <laughs> <laughs> so can, can you talk can you talk me through for the for those who can't see it? Obviously you dressed yeah. like gangsters. Well, yeah, that's it. We've got a, like um, pinstripe suits, um, flower in the lapel, jazzy ties, carrying Ian Rush and Brian Robson are carrying kind of rifles, and then then there's a tray of um, of, of of shin pads. Look, it's beautiful. <laughs> Marcus Argard asks: Since it is January transfer window, have you got a dream transfer for your respective clubs, Leicester, Newcastle, and Manchester City? It says here, but that could be one of many clubs for my. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, well, to be honest, for Leicester, I'm 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 happy with the, the way they're going. Um, they're doing um, brilliantly well, flying at the top of the league through to the fourth round of the FA Cup. So I think I think save the money to see what happens uh, at the end of the season, if and when they get promoted, and then go for it. Then Newcastle, Allen, you with the injuries you've got, you could certainly do with one or two. I think we need, yeah, we need a goalkeeper. I think we need um, a midfielder and we need a forward. Yeah. So good luck trying to find a goal scorer because there's so many after yeah. uh, after the after a goal score. We all know that. So yeah, that's uh, the dream one. Yeah. Oh. Mbappe. <laughs> <laughs> I've just read Mbappe is definitely going to Real Madrid. I would next oh, season. Is that is that actually official or is? Because he's been Apparently going to Madrid so. about three times before. It's not quite happened. He has to. He has to leave, doesn't he? he? Has to move to. I think it's not fair though. That is it. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I mean, it, um, we 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 put a we put a bid in for him. We tried to tap him up, but he, <laughs> instead of choosing Newcastle, he's gone to Real Madrid. Yeah. Imagine Oof. that vinicius uh, Rodrigo, Mbappe, and Bellingham. And Bellingham. Oh, oh my god! Yeah, it's, yeah. Not yeah. it's not fair. That it's not fair. No, Mbappe is sensational. I, I, oh, I mean, it's mad best. that he's not he's yet won a, a Ballon d'Or, but I think that's that, that's inevitable. Once he once Imminent, he gets to Real Madrid, where they generally do have one or two uh, Ballon d'Or winners at that particular club. Uh, what about um, who who do you want to go? Manchester City, Arsenal? Which no, let, let's let's. I mean, I'll I'll, oh, I'll go Man City. Uh, they don't need anyone. No, uh, <laughs> Arsenal. We know same as the striker, like most. Uh, oh, Arsenal striker. Osserman. Osserman, yeah. yeah. He's, he's, I think he's... So he signed yeah, a new deal. He signed a new deal at Napoli. I was surprised at that because they're struggling this season. What about, what are they, seventh, eighth in the league or something? Or was oh. that to get rid of his buyout clause? Maybe, maybe. Was, maybe. Who knows with these things. Osserman would be my yeah. one for Arsenal. I, th I saw him play at, um, at Leicester in the Europa League um, a couple of seasons ago. And um, poor, he was he was absolutely brilliant that day at um, at the King Power. Anyway, on that note, um, we'll call it a day for our questions episode. We'll be back later in the week. Um, thank you once again for your continued support of the podcast and sending your questions in. They are uh, much appreciated. Thank you so much, and goodbye from me. Goodbye from me. Goodbye from me. Cheers. Bye.